your help, we can continue to fight for freedom. This is not possible without your generosity. Join our quest for the truth and our freedom and donate today. Simply go to tntradio.live. Deconstructing PSYOPs, propaganda, and mainstream media garbage. Connecting the dots. You're with Matt Arrett and Connecting the Dots on today's News Talk Radio, TNT. All right, welcome back to the third hour of Connecting the Dots. I am your host, Matt Arrett, and... uh, I've had a lot of friends over the over the years who would tell me stories that ah I I I I'd love to ha- talking about ideas and politics but my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my wife, my husband they don't care about ideas. They don't care about these things. And uh and so they they're they're feeling very, very frustrated and and I want to feel, you know, I feel empathy and sympathy but at the same time I feel gratitude that I don't have that problem at all. <laughs> and Cynthia Chung uh has been my partner, my friend, my my co-researcher and she has done amazing work uh making breakthroughs on matters of intelligence, history that have just blown my mind and have blown a lot of people's minds. Uh, recently she came out with a new book uh well, a new book. It was last year called The Empire on Which the Black Sun Never Set: A History of Anglo-American uh, presence in shaping international fascism. Uh, that would be volume one of what is becoming a series of books really going deeper into the nature and heart of fascism and how our world just became so damn messed up. What exactly happened? Did conventional military just become insane by itself or has there been some something systematic shaping this insanity? Um which obviously, for those watching this show and who, or who have encountered Cynthia's writings, yeah, the answer is, yeah, there's something to be discovered, uh, which is dark, but it's important to look at it, map it out. And recently, Cynthia has written a couple of very important essays that are a part of what will be volume two of The Empire in Which the Black Sun Never Set, um, which are extremely relevant for today. Um, so I'm going to bring on Cynthia. Cynthia Chung, thank you for coming on as my guest on Connecting the Dots. Always a pleasure. All right. (laughs) So you wrote recently a couple of pieces, one on how Panama became the Skynet for Orwellian totalitarianism in the Americas. And something else as a follow-up, which whose name I'm kind of forgetting off the top of my head, dealing with uh, a, a deeper dive on Operation Gladio, Vietnam, and um, and some of the unresolved elements of fascists who were incorporated into Western intelligence after World War II. Th- this is something that is so important. And today, we have you know in the in the news uh, announcements that Taiwan is going to be hosting Green Berets, who will be training the Taiwanese military in their freedom struggle against big bad China and a lot of people who consume the media in the in the west are supposed to sort of feel warm fuzzy feelings like a our, our heroes the green beret heroes are defending freedom again we they were they were also in Ukraine as we discovered last night you know looking at well what else have the green berets doing been doing lately while well, they were in Ukraine uh since the beginning of this whole operation against Russia using a bunch of Ukrainian proxies training Ukrainian militia and soldiers. We see them also with a deep presence all over South America for many, many years, decades even. Um, So what is this? What, what, how do, how should people be thinking about the Green Berets? Is this really a patriotic agency as we've been told, or is there something darker at play? Um, Well, in order to understand what the Green Berets are, you need to first look at what they were modeled off of, which was the British Special Forces. So contrary to what a lot of people I think have been led to believe, Kennedy was not responsible at all for the Green Berets, not even the revival of the Green uh, Beret program during his presidency. But in fact, they were started as a World War II um, Special Forces unit. Again, um, inspired by and closely working with the British Special Forces in Europe, such that the Green Beret is the like a a tip of the hat to the British Special Forces. They were brothers in arms. And this was 
a part of what would uh, become known as uh, Churchill's secret armies. So Operation Unthinkable was uh, something that Churchill was concocting shortly after Roosevelt's death while World War II was still um, ongoing with the two possible premises that either uh, we would need stay behind units because it was clear that Germany was going to lose, but we would still need stay behind units um, stationed all throughout Europe in case of either a Russian invasion or um, just to have like a, a kind of defense, you know, just in case kind of thing. And uh, it ended up not happening, obviously. And they justified that they still needed to stay in these areas throughout Europe because there was the threat of communism um, becoming democratically chosen in governments. Italy was the first election that was going to happen after World War II. And it was clear that the communists were going to be voted into that government because the communists were the ones who primarily fought against Mussolini. And that was the case for many of these countries. It was the communists who actually did the most to fight back the Italian fascists and the German Nazis. And so obviously there was a lot of popular support. And this was something that was considered intolerable to um, Churchill, who was very much also um, in control of American foreign policy. So that's what the Green Berets come out of is Churchill's secret armies. And uh, there have been there's been a declassification in the late 1990s. There was one of the biggest declassifications of uh, the Nazi and Japanese uh, fascist papers that were, you know, held by the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, so forth. And it also uh, incorporates British intelligence as well. And that's when we started to realize more concretely what these uh, secret armies, these stay behind uh, units were actually doing, which was terrorism. They were committing terrorism against the European people and the American people. This is also a continuation of like Coental Pro type operations that were were done against the civil rights movement. They're connected. Um, Operation Northwoods was something that was actually, you know, proposed to um, Kennedy to stage a false flag attack on the American people and American military personnel and blame it on Castro as an excuse to invade Cuba. Um, so these were the kinds of things. Some of them, you know, didn't happen. And a lot of them did, including assassinations of Democratic leaders, de Gaulle, uh, had over 30 assassination attempts, and this uh, the stay behind units were involved in a great deal of that. So this was clearly very undemocratic, very, um, you know, the opposite of what they were saying, which was that this was supposed to be a protection of the people against totalitarianism. Um, so the Green Berets have continued to, to, to be that either under Eisenhower's administration, because Eisenhower was aware of this. He he was, uh, you know, obviously a veteran of World War II. He was in the know. But there were a lot of people who were not in the know of this because it was still uh, highly classified at the time. And so when Kennedy came in, this stuff was uh, basically revived under Alan Dulles, the director of the CIA, during the transition of the Eisenhower and Kennedy administration. And Kennedy had absolutely nothing to do with it. And the, the guy that you forgot the name of, Matt, it's a Colonel Fletcher Prouty, who is the mm -hmm. one who's written the book, The Secret Team, as well as uh, JFK. And it's a very long title. I think it's like Vietnam and the assassination of uh, Kennedy. And he goes over this. He was the liaison between the Pentagon and the CIA. And he, he, you know, knew Alan Dulles uh, quite uh, closely uh, in terms of a, a working relationship between uh, the Pentagon and the CIA. So this is what um, occurred. I could go yeah, that, on. That's or... great. No, that's a, that's... <laughs> no, that was a <laughs> thorough answer. That was good. And um when when you say that they were carrying out um, terrorist acts, and you you brought up Northwoods uh, as a justification to to invade a country, uh, you brought up assassination attempts of high value targets like De Gaulle, like JFK, uh, many others. Um, you there's also the question of of terrorist acts in general to the populace, um, which surprised me. It was only with your work that I started appreciating that that was actually what it. I didn't realize what this was. You know, we hear about the Red Brigades. 
we hear about these different anarchist, anti-imperial, liberation. We were in the 60s. Um, so how is this not Marxist-Leninist? How is this actually tied to this Gladio or one of the techniques uh, of the Gladio secret army operation? And, and how did they benefit from that? The the ideology behind it was, um, you know, essentially uh, a, a kind of Christian fascist outlook um, that was closely, you know, uh, wanting to bring back the 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 romantic idea are we on the air am i on the air you're on the air on the air 24 7 your news talk giant tnt all right welcome back to the second segment of connecting the dots uh apologies for those watching uh there was a little bit of a weird break there we had there was a technical glitch in the system do apologize for that um but we're back here with cynthia chung and we were she was just uh, going through a little bit of an answer to my question, which was, well, what is the strategy? What was the strategy behind uh, bombing civilian centers across Europe, uh, letterbox bombs uh, across Quebec and New York and the U.S. and everything else? Um, how are these not actually Marxist-Leninist uh, organizations as they were portrayed um, carrying out these attacks against evil, evil capitalist empire, as as w that was the message of the sixties. Well, how was this actually tied to the the Nazi fascist Gladio NATO secret army networks? What did they want to accomplish by that? And then I have a question about uh, Colonel Fletcher Prouty and something about uh, the reform of the U.S. military after you you finish that. Mm -hmm. Well, they, I mean, they were blaming it on the, the communists. So obviously, uh, that was going to make the communists look bad. And it was, it was thought that, you know, people would be pushed away and, uh, towards the arms of a far right wing government. Because the thing is, is that, um, and, you know, Alex Craner, he's, he's also done really good work to, to back this up that um, World War II is not what we've been told in terms of the allies, you know, versus the bad guys. Um, and the reality of the situation was that there were a lot of people in England, in the United States, in France, who were supporting um, this trend towards uh, a fascist way of, of government. And, you know, there were people who preferred Mussolini's uh, fascist corporatism versus, you know, Hitler, who was, uh, you know, a little bit more uh, unpredictable and uh, over the top. But at the end of the day, there were that was what the the idea was, you know, the League of Nations concept, which was to have a few about six control centers in the world and that the rest of the world was going to be like one big satrapy. Um, and breadbasket to service these like control centers. Um, so that is what the League of Nations is. And that's what has always been the, the mission. And even though we technically won World War II, that was not supposed to happen, by the way, and Russia was supposed to have been destroyed um, in World War II, according to these planners, they, um, they just ended up continuing these policies um, some of it underground, like the secret army type uh, activity, but some of it was, you know, embedded in institutions and, and so forth. And it has been just working slowly um, towards another uh, opportunity to to bring this online, you know, uh, in a, a global way. And so, again, the ideology behind this is there's a lot of Christian fascism uh, involved in this. There's there's a reason why, you know, the the pope at the time uh, was not talking against Mussolini's actions in Italy. Um, and there's this idea of the of revival of the Crusades and the whole, mm. um, you know, belief system that comes with that. Um, yeah. Which is really just Satanism masquerading as Christianity. When one looks at really in a sober mind what the Crusades were, it really wasn't a Christian thing. That was like Christians killing Christians and Jews and Muslims. And, and it was all geopolitical. And it was a bloodbath of death for centuries 
around geopolitical operations. But this is the type of thing that they're trying to revive in the new age as far as redefining what makes one a, a, a proper Christian is to be effectively a crusading fascist. And you, you brought up how the ideology of these special forces runs completely contrary to the type of historic traditional ideology of defense of the military, of the citizen soldier, um, which is, I guess, very much, it, it is this, right? It's it's like, this is not America. This is not what what America was, was grounded upon or, or any nation that's viable. It, this is something that sort of infused itself as a corrupting influence, um, as a different ideology, which is just permanent war, permanent revolution. Um, but on that note, well, that's why Eisenhower had brought that up, right? And in his farewell yeah. address, which had a lot of obviously problems uh, in terms of him just like, you know, basically announcing that he had this monster festering in the basement the whole time called the military industrial complex. And it's like, okay, I'm, I'm off now. But um, he was also bringing up the point of the citizen soldier in that a responsible nation that actually is caring for the welfare of their own people, because by the way, war also puts into jeopardy the safety of your own people, right? Um, you want to have a balance in the world that is um, mutual respect and uh, mutual cooperation in a reasonable way. And when you have a permanent war machine, that's clearly for an imperialistic uh, purpose. That's not a defensive purpose. And so Eisenhower clearly saw that this was a problem. And as Proudy makes a, a point in his uh, books, um, Eisenhower, at least to his credit, was not um, allowing the special forces to continue because that was not supposed to be something that continued during peacetime. It kind of made sense in certain ways during World War II, but it was absolutely unacceptable besides the fact that they are even on top of this committing terrorism against their own people to to manipulate um people's political views um it's not it's not in anyone's best interest to have a permanent warrior unit like that and uh, that's what the US special forces was and this is what Alan Dulles ended up um reviving so that he could wield that weapon under the direction of uh, the CIA. I don't know if you wanted to have a follow-up question before I go further. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's the great, that, no, by bringing up Del Dulles as well and the CIA in general as, as this new institution that was created as a, as the basis of a, of the, of a parallel state effectively is what, what you're saying. Um, right. You made the point in your papers that it became increasingly difficult to discern uh, the difference between CIA operatives and conventional military and the, the this reform of the US military that Proudy talks about and that you you document how 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 did that CIA infiltration and takeover uh occur over the course of the I guess the Cold War and and over people like JFK's dead body well, how how do they do that well, uh, it started with Frank Wisner and, you know, Frank Wisner, Ellen Dulles, they were already a part of the OSS before they went into the CIA. And David Talbot in his uh, the, the Devil's Chess Board has, you know, documented very well, made a very solid point that Ellen Dulles was involved with, uh, you know, traitorous activity uh, in Switzerland, communicating with Nazis and helping Nazis. Uh, so was his brother, John Foster Dulles, who was the Secretary of State under Eisenhower's administration. And um, basically, Frank Wisner had started a clandestine operations um, unit uh, off as an offshoot from the CIA that was working with the secret armies in Europe. Um, so they were basically continuing a Churchill, you know, foreign policy, even though this was not agreed upon as an American foreign policy. And they um, basically were operating without any kind of purview from the American government or the American military. They weren't often aware at all with what this unit was. And the CIA was supposed to be a desk job. Uh, but this thing just got out of hand. And there, I think that, you know, Churchill also played a very big role with the Iron Curtain speech and having a lot of, uh, you know, control and pressure over American foreign policy that shaped, you know, the Cold War. American foreign policy under the Cold War was completely shaped by Churchill's decisions. Um, so this was brewing 
Um, and the clandestine operations started to become under the purview of the CIA. So you had the U.S. military for anything that was open warfare, but anything that was considered clandestine increasingly became the responsibility of the CIA. But it started to get to a ridiculous point. The Vietnam War was, you know, is probably the most ridiculous one where they were claiming that there was clandestine operations, thus CIA should be completely in charge of the situation when everybody in Vietnam knew what was going on, everyone in China knew, and everyone in the Soviet Union knew what Americans were doing in Vietnam. It wasn't clandestine anymore. So um, this started to um, allow the CIA to expand what which what basically a, a paramilitary, which is kind of like an underground military, a black ops uh, military uh, that is not answering to the president, not answering to anybody in government, not answering even to the U.S. military. And then when Dulles revived the Green Beret program, which had already been manufactured under the Churchill's secret army unit. Um, this was the, the weapon to continue the, um, you know, that the League of Nations uh, Christian fascist uh, program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you made the point as well that that they would go into um, like up to 40 allied states who were sort of united in stopping the the Hitler machine originally, and in as part of this re, re utilization of these unreconstructed fascists and Nazis that were now working for NATO and the CIA, they began to like you just said create these paramilitary shadow organizations infiltrating their police forces, infiltrating their uh, creating subsections within their the these target nations national militaries that would not be beholden to the elected representatives of those countries, but would be thus beholden to the centralized command uh, that didn't, that wasn't out tied to any particular country. That's a yeah, really the, fascinating. Point. Yeah. These soldiers, yeah. The, the green berets have never been for protecting the people. They serve a master that is separate from government, even separate from the U S military and, um, you know, when the Green, Green Berets came out of their revival program with their experience in Vietnam, Proudy makes the point, too, that these Green Berets, when they came back to the United States, a lot of them went into police work in the United States, which is not that's not good news. Um, and, you know, they're very experienced with training police units in other countries. So, so basically, the Green Beret program became an international program. Um, and Proudy makes the point that the, how the U.S. military got taken over in his book, The Secret Team, he explains that it was Maxwell Taylor, who was this military man who resigned during Eisenhower's administration. And he was brought it back in during the Kennedy administration through CIA corridors. Um, and Kennedy was misled to believe that this was like an old soldier that he could rely upon. That was because, you know, Kennedy got screwed over with the Bay of Pigs fiasco. I've uh, done a paper on this, uh, The Damned Murdered Inc., Kennedy's Battle Against the Leviathan. People can check out on my Substack through Glass Darkly. But basically, he got screwed over by elements of the military and the CIA in this. And so he was distrustful of everybody. And so Maxwell Taylor, who had resigned during the Eisenhower administration, was brought in by Alan Dulles. Kennedy didn't know this. And so Kennedy trusted him, and he ended up putting him in uh, chief uh, of uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, he he put him in that position and fired a Lemnitzer. But what ended up happening, Prouty makes a very well-documented case for this, is that Maxwell Taylor was not an old soldier of the traditional U.S. military. He was actually for the new form of warfare, counterinsurgency, which is the perpetual war machine, which I don't know if we have a commercial break before I get into that. No, no, we actually we got the commercial break out of the way by accident uh, earlier, so we can actually go on for another ten minutes before we we shift gears really? to commercials. So yeah, you okay. can totally expand on counterinsurgency and pacification tactics and whatever else you want to elaborate on. Go for it. Yeah, so um, it was Maxwell Taylor who actually was a CIA man at that point, and um, at that point there were a lot of people with government titles who were working for the CIA actually there were CIA agents McGeorge Bundy is like a very well known uh name of uh, as an example of that 
And um, there were many people within the U.S. military at that point that were increasingly starting to work for the CIA, um, but they were under a, a military title. And so it was making it look like there was this kind of balance within government and military to have all of these different checkpoints of OKs, when in fact it was all like CIA <laughs> control checkpoints, which again, Proudy is the one who, who documents this very, very uh, well. So um, the Greenberries were bought into Vietnam, and this is where the um, the warfare of counterinsurgency was expanded upon. Uh, the French in the Algerian War uh, were, were the first ones to start doing this. And again, a lot of these guys who were uh, a part of the Algerian War, they were part of the secret army units. And uh, when de Gaulle wanted to leave uh Algeria, he didn't want, you know, a French colonial presence there anymore. There were elements of the French military and intelligence that wanted to oust him. So that actually was happening, overlapping the Bay of Pigs. Was That's this, the, uh, the Algiers, uh, the Algiers push, push, right? Yeah, the general's okay. push against uh, de Gaulle. And again, like the, the, there were sections of the military and the intelligence that served the Christian fascist, you know, ideology that thought de Gaulle was a traitor and they wanted to kill him. There was multiple assassination attempts and they tried to overthrow him as well. This is also why de Gaulle kicked out NATO out of France, because these are known after Churchill's secret armies. They later on later on became known as NATO's secret armies. And Daniela Ganser has done a very uh, great book, uh, great research on NATO's secret armies that were stationed all around uh, Europe. So de Gaulle was very aware of this, and he kicked NATO out of France. To this day, they try to act like it wasn't that, but it, it most certainly was that. Um, so anyway, the the Green Berets were taking their um, training manual from these, these French Christian fascists, basically militant Christian fascists, and they started to expand on the counterinsurgency doctrine in Vietnam, which was basically how I see it, it was just like a laboratory for them. And it was an it was an Orwellian laboratory where they had torture centers. The Phoenix program is notorious for it was it the estimates are over 70,000 people were tortured and murdered in this program. Um, but it was uh, all about, you know, testing out certain kinds of control tactics and psychological warfare tactics and so forth. Uh, and again, police policing is a central role of the Green Berets. And I would say it's an Orwellian form of policing. People should also be aware that Orwell was uh, stationed in Burma as a, a chief policeman who engaged in torture techniques in Burma in service to the British Empire. And this is largely where he got his insight from 1984 in terms of the uh, the O'Brien character is probably a lot of Orwell's own experience and also observing other people's, you know, uh, it, it, how they dealt with torture techniques in Burma. So um, this program then later on was used in many, many other places in the world. It, it was expanded globally to about uh, 40 at first. It's now more than that, but Proudy says it was 40 host countries. So these countries accepted the special forces in and increasingly under Maxwell Taylor, the uh, new philosophy of the U.S. military was supposed to be um, everything. Uh, a, a reform of everything, politics, education, economics, um, culture, it's all under the U.S. military now. And we really saw that clearly with uh, the war on terror, the illegal invasion of Iraq and the U.S. military's stationing in Iraq. This is that was that program that was being implemented. Um, they think that they have the right to come into a country and do everything their way. And anyone who stands uh, in opposition to that needs to be removed. And so the special forces team is largely considered the guardians, the gladiators of the figureheads that are chosen, not by the people, but uh, whatever their master tells them is someone they need to protect. Um, so they're uh, incredibly um, dangerous. <laughs> They're the very yeah, no, it, it does. Yeah, no, it does seem like it's a 
it's a uh it's like a praetorian guard right like a roman legion elite legion praetorian guard that are cultish under the complete they, they they're not made up of individuals they are seen as you just said as a sword gladio operation gladio i never thought it thought about it actually until you just said it the way you said it just here and now is that the idea of gladio which is the italian word for sword is has that name not not because of like some imagery or symbolism of like hey that sword looks cool as a as an icon for this or that but it's like they see this army force as a tool for whatever geopolitical ends the masters want to wield the sword for not as made up of people who can make decisions or think as sovereign citizens at all um which mm -hmm. is where i guess you get this sort of stuff like we've seen um seymour hirsch early in the 70s document or blow the whistle on things like the my Lai massacre the, this ideology of you have to burn down the village to save the village like why did mm -hmm. we burn down why did we kill all the women and children in, in in the village in vietnam well we had to burn it down to save it from what like where you, that's insane but you get this sort of thing right in this whole revolution of military affairs ideology that oversaw desert storm that oversaw hundreds of thousands of children dying since desert storm and since 9 11 and the war on terror there's millions of deaths and it's like there's this this justification of it like it, it's all worth it it's all worth it because of x whatever imagine what is that thing that they think makes it all worth it like what are they um what is in their mind that makes burning down the village necessary to save the village or doing this these atrocities torture of innocence uh, they, I think that they have, you know, it's it's an ideological belief of how the world should be. And so anything that is not that is in, they think is their purview to demolish and destroy. And um, I guess we'll get into this maybe, uh, I don't know if we have time to get into this uh, fully, but Operation Condor was the the gladio continuation into south america and i think a lot of people know that a lot of nazis went to south america as well and operation gladio was something that was a continuation of the secret army apparatus um many nazis as well were involved in training these secret armies in uh, the south american countries along with the the cia again and the the us special forces played a leading role in training the death squads and the center for training was in panama and there was also All the right. center let, let's use that as a very potent uh, bridge into our commercial break. And then we're going to come back right. on today's News Talk TNT to see where this goes with Panama and the role of Panama in the past and present in mm -hmm. the geopolitical affairs. Give me a minute with TNT Radio's Steve Malzberg. When it comes to the left-wing media, we all know by now they call Donald Trump every name in the book, and they don't cover his speeches very often because they say he lies. Donald Trump lies about America's greatness. Donald Trump lies about America's men and women in uniform. Donald Trump lies about what small business owners and entrepreneurs and, 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 and the geniuses of Silicon Valley and what the, the geniuses on Main Street USA, what they're all doing. And so-called fact checkers have been living off of Donald Trump. But if anybody dares to fact check Joe Biden, <laughs> Well, watch. It is ridiculous yeah. that the New York Times fact checked Joe Biden on something. I mean, he vomits lies. Trump vomits lies. And he, every day, yeah. over and over and over again. And it's just ridiculous that the New York Times is doing a fact check on, on Biden while they let Trump, while they're numb to the torrent of lies coming out of Trump's mouth. That's former U.S. Senator Democrat Claire McCaskill. And that's what passes for our media right now and it's not getting any better. Thanks for giving me a minute. I'm Steve Malsberg. Catch my show Monday through Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern time, right here on TNT. <laughs> my baby's back from the West Coast. <laughs> Hear those pictures that you asked for for your school project? First day of school, cute as a button. <laughs> <laughs> so long ago. Oh, here's Grandma Florence after that flood wiped out the whole neighborhood. Sometimes I just cannot believe all the storms we've gone through here. I can only hope that we'll be able to leave this house to you one day, baby. You're our legacy. Planning for these disasters will make sure we're safe. And is the best way to protect that legacy. Ah, those beans smell heavenly. Mm -hmm. Give mom a little credit. You know what? 
We should make an emergency communication plan. That way we're ready this year. Oh, great idea. At my dorm, we have emergency kits for earthquakes and wildfires, but I'm sure there's something more local I can send you with the link. Okay. Smart. I'm coming to share with you guys. Protect your legacy. Plan for natural disasters today. Visit ready.gov forward slash plan. Matt Arrett and Connecting the Dots on today's News Talk Radio, TNT. All right, welcome back to the third segment of the third hour of Connecting the Dots. I'm here with Cynthia Chung, and after painting a vivid image of the destruction that had been caused by uh, the special forces operations that were run by the CIA across Vietnam that interfaced with unreconstructed Nazis, fascists, Italian fascists that tried to kill the Gaul, that carried out mm-hmm. counterinsurgency, pacification, torture techniques, killing a lot of innocent civilians along the way, turning the West into an empire. Uh, you mentioned you, you you tied that back into Panama, Latin America, and Panama being the base of operations for this operation. Today, we are being told all sorts of things about how the Chinese, the Chai comms are out trying to destroy America by controlling immig- immigrants from, from Panama, the Darien Gap, up through into uh, Texas borders to destroy America from within. So we're being fed a lot of Cold War style propaganda right now, ignoring the fact that the real problems of Latin America and Latin American all pretty much controls of immigrations and everything else uh, would be under the tight control of that infrastructure that was set up over decades before most people listening here were even born. Um, so what what is it about Operation Condor that you're that you're that you're digging up? What how does this all tie into Latin America? Well, um, along with the huge declassification act that happened at the end of the 1990s, the where we found out about Gladio and just how awful this whole thing was, um, the extent of the the attacks that were happening on um, Western people, um, Condor was also uh, revealed a lot of information on Operation Condor that wasn't known up until that point. Um, And so, you know, like the Pinochet situation, all of this, this was all a part of Condor. Actually, Chile and Argentina were the main um, control nodes for Operation Condor in South America that involved about six control centers, six countries that were working as control centers. And again, uh, the U.S. Special Forces played the leading role in training um, special forces that would South Americans who would become special forces in their countries, right? The same thing happened in Vietnam. No Dinh Diem, uh, his South Vietnam government, he had Vietnamese people who were also trained by the Green Berets to be his his uh, his uh, Gladio guards. These uh, the South Americans were also they they he was they the one select- who was, he was the one who was uh, assassinated, right? Diem. He's the yeah, he was the head of the South Viet the right. day old South Vietnamese uh, government right. to uh as an excuse for why uh, the Vietnam War had to happen. By the way, we don't have time to talk about this, but Proudy also makes the point that the whole uh justification for the US entry into Vietnam was due to a false migrant crisis that had been organized mm-hmm. by the CIA by Edward Lansdale's uh, Saigon mission where they committed terrorist acts in uh northern Vietnam and caused a huge uh you know um migration of people they even offered to transport people on boats from north Vietnam to south Vietnam and then they just unloaded them onto the South Vietnamese people where, you know, there was not going to be enough resources to support all of these people. Obviously, there was a lot of uh, theft and there was a lot of uh, crime that was brought into that. And uh, the Americans, the special forces, the CIA were were directly involved in creating that false migrant crisis to then bring in the U.S. military. So that's an important people, important point people need to understand is that the CIA has been creating um, conflicts in clandestine operations until they get so big that it justifies entry of the U.S. military, which, by the way, is kind of what's starting to happen in Ukraine right now, where we already have NATO soldiers in Ukraine, and there's going to definitely be 
an increase in um, that pressure cooker that is going to try to drag the European militaries and the American military into that conflict when it never had to happen that way. I'll just uh, punctuate that just to make it so clear uh if people are listening to this thinking hey that doesn't affect me i'm i'm in europe this that you're that's interesting facts that you're bringing up from the 60s but that doesn't affect my life think again you got lloyd austin also making allusions to having a a preparation of from nato to go to war uh backing up ukraine officially macron said it openly uh putin has been trying really hard to make it very clear that this is like like world war three end of civilization stuff don't do it and on the other hand you have the the very thing the immigration crisis the fact that immigrants are will be more in or illegal immigrants especially are going to be more inclined perhaps to um carry out acts of uh vandalism theft other things when is exactly what is creating the tension this 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 tension exactly. in america today yeah. and chaos very similar to what was done in Vietnam's case, overseen by the same forces, using the same yeah, techniques. Yeah. yeah, like why Why would so many people in the millions want to leave their homes with like the very young and the very old traveling in incredibly unsafe ways where the risk of you, you know, either getting uh, robbed or molested or murdered is very high. Um, so obviously these people are in a very desperate situation and we have to ask the question, well, what is going on in South America that is causing this to occur on a scale that has, has not been happening, um, for the last few decades. And so the thing with operation Condor is that it was in, you know, full operation in the seventies up until I would say at least the early nineties. And then it looked like it kind of stopped because democratically, you know, elected governments replaced the military dictatorships in South America. By the way, the drug problem in South America is also completely tied to this whole Gladio thing. It's not the communists. The drugs uh, fund the black ops operations that are the Gladio operations. Nixon's war on drugs was basically to centralize American control of the drug uh, money. And that's why we have American soldiers who are in Afghanistan who were babysitting opium fields. Um, and Henrik Kruger, uh, The Great Heroin Coup, he that's a very good book for people uh, to reference if they want to know more about that. So anyway, Operation Condor, contrary to what we were told, it continued. It's just it established parallel states in South America. So we have a whole system of a black ops capability, you know, separate police stations, separate interrogation centers, this kind of scary Orwellian stuff. That's what was set up. And uh, Panama has always been the the nerve center of that. And Condor Tell was the computer system where all of these operations could communicate with each other throughout South America and later on Central America. So when people say like U.S. Green Berets, like Michael Yan say, oh, uh, what's going on? People are crossing the border and nothing is happening. The U.S. Special Forces have always been totally you know front center involved in this because the way operation condor was was that you could get people false passports you could they they controlled border crossings for their death squads like it's not this is something that they've had a complete control over through their computer system condor tell and the more broad uh system copy uh that the americans have always been uh in charge of to coordinate with all of these Gladio uh, networks. So it's complete bunk that they don't have control over that. They completely do. And they're probably causing the migrants to to cross because they're doing clearly stuff in South America that we're we're not uh, aware of yet. And also just to very um, punctuate this, the Gladio networks were responsible for the assassination of Kennedy. And uh, people can go on to my Through Glass Darkly Substack um, to to refer to to that. Uh, I have an article on the front page that you can find. So this is extremely, this is the biggest threat to and everyone's safety, including, you know, causing escalations that threaten nuclear war on people. This is this is everything, really. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean. You're you're making it very very clear um, that this is the case, and 
I mean, again, you, you people have this John Wayne image, right, that's been marketed to them through Hollywood of, like, the Green Berets or, you know, these noble – and I'm, not, it, 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 I'm sure there's a lot of good people who are Green Berets. There's probably a lot of good people who are in the – not probably. There are a ton of good people in the, in the military who were in it for the – they went in because they want to defend their nations. They want to do good and spread freedom and all these good things. But then there's this other thing, which is there as well, <laughs> which oversaw the murder, which w- without taking that into consideration, you can't understand why so many Latin American leaders who are trying to nationalize uh, their 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 privatized operations from, you know, that would had formerly been controlled by Wall Street bankers in London uh, enterprises. Every time that that happens where something is done to try to defend the people of a, of a country, including the United States under John F. Kennedy – they're assassinated. You can't account for why those assassinations happen, why those coups happen, unless you take into consideration what the hell happened to take over control like a virus of our military and our nations, which has no allegiance to the people of America or any nation. It's 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 something else. And it's tied to what what made the Crusades happen a thousand years ago. And I love the fact that in your book and your especially the empire in which the black sun never sets, you really make it clear that this is like a, um, a, a, a an imperial um, Roman Empire fascist revivalism. This restoration of oligarchism under the veneer of some like spiritualized feudalism that rebranded as Christianity. <laughs> that 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 people like Count Kudenhova Kalergi have been trying to bring about. And the and and I didn't know about so much of this stuff until you you plunged into it. Uh, but without that, you can't understand how how NATO was created, how the European Union was created, how all of these things, how all of these these Nazis and fascists went unpunished. But but with that in mind, all of a sudden, everything falls nicely into place. Everything kind of makes a lot more sense. And you can account for um, what is this restoration of of these like, you know, it's it's become cool increasingly amongst a, a lot of people within the uh, what's called the trad the trad conservative world to look upon things like the inquisition or the crusades or feudalism as the, as the time when things were stable and good before liberals like Soros corrupted us all. And then we, you know, before progressives allowed for women to get the vote or uh, get out of the house before that was when we had stability and morality and traditional values. And it's like, it's kind of mixed in with a lot of very bad things. So like, where is that coming from? Where, how is Peter Thiel, a multi-billionaire tied to big tech and, and the entire, you know, transhumanist enterprise. Why is he promoting this type of thing to revive romanticization of, um, of the crusades, you know? So you have all of this stuff that's, that's that a lot of good people who we know are, are finding themselves really influenced by blaming Looking at things as if, you know, the, the monarchies were great. It was just the Jews, the Jew bankers who took control of the monarchies of Europe that made things bad. That's what caused all of the bad is the Jews, right? Which is, who got killed a lot in the Crusades? It was the Jews. Right? And it, 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 we're, we're seeing a, a revivalism of all the stuff also now added with this anti-China stuff. So maybe for the last bit, uh, China has definitely been targeted for um, an operation to destroy them, just like Russia has. They're being encircled by the U.S. military. It's been going on for a while. There's now Green Berets in Taiwan. Uh, China is active building infrastructure around the world. Um, that's the case definitely for South America. There's ports that China's bu- been building, hydroelectric dams, electricity grids. That's provable. But most Americans don't know this. They think China is, is only there to do basically what we've been doing already for like 80 years. <laughs> um what can you say about what is China doing in – because there is there are Chinese workers in a military age, as they say in all media. <laughs> military <laughs> age Chinese Chinese workers are there in South America. That's true. What are, what are the sorts of things that they are doing there around the world? Why are they a threat to the thing controlling the CIA? Well, again, John Perkins in his Confessions of an Economic Hitman, um, very popular book that I think people need to remind themselves of. Um, South America and Central America were not just attacked by these um, Condor death squad units. 
it was also an economic looting of these countries. Um, you know, Pinochet is is one of the free market type uh, examples, right? And that's why fascism also has always had a, a certain idea of like the fascist corporatism uh, idea. So these countries were attacked economically. And um, China has always understood this, that uh, you cannot be a sovereign nation state if you don't have economic sovereignty. And the way that you have economic sovereignty is that you have a functional infrastructure and you have an ability to um, so self-sustain yourself to a certain point and trade um, eff effectively with what you need to, to receive in terms of resources. And this has been a central issue for national sovereignty. So it's it's kind of funny that people think that China is in these areas that have a huge historical record like Condor uh, of operating in Central and South America, and they're building things. And we're somehow thinking that the building of things must be sinister, whereas maybe China actually understands that if you want to have a balance, the best way to, to address the hegemony that has become clearly destructive, an Anglo-American hegemonic power that goes into countries and literally blows them up and tries to uh, build back better, you know, type approach with U.S. military dictating how this is going to, how the reform is going to go. This is obviously not a good idea. And the reason why China has become very secretive in some of these um, BRI construction camps is because there has been a lot of terrorist activity against these construction workers because the hegemonic power clearly doesn't want these things being built because it will allow for increased national sovereignty. And so there is a lot of protection of these camps and they are of course not gonna open their door to just anybody, including by the way, Michael Yan who was apparently, you know, trying to get Brett Weinstein a peek into this like camp of like 100 Asians, hostile Asians, because they didn't want to talk to him. Why would they allow a Green Beret to come into their camp? Um, obvious. And they're there with the invitation of the Panamanian government, you know? Yeah. So why are the Berets there? Do they have permission um, this has always been a, a really big issue with the Americans is that they apparently think that they can be in any country, even if they're not invited. Um, whereas another foreign country that's invited into that country for construction projects is apparently not, uh, allowed to be there if the Americans don't want them there. Well, as, as Brett Weinstein says, you know, in talk, the, the Panamanians didn't even have the respect to ask permission of the right. US military before they signed a, a an infrastructure deal with China how could how dare they not ask permission to build a road and a bridge from the US military first before doing that something like me. that I, that reminds me there was a, a we have German one minute. Okay, that reminds me of a German energy minister who had signed a contract with uh, China on the hydrocarbons deal right before Biden became president and Biden's like you didn't wait for me to become president and ask my permission. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. He's like, no, we're, we're a sovereign nation state. We can we don't have to ask your permission. <laughs> and then how much longer do they have to wait for the Nord Stream 2 to get blown up um, after Biden has said, we're going to blow it up. And Newland said, we're going to blow it up. Um, <laughs> and everyone's supposed to, like, still thank the United States for their generosity, for, for allowing the Germans to eat bugs uh, along with the, the Davos crew. So you got 15 seconds left. Where can people go and follow your work, Cynthia? Uh, through Gloss Darkly on Substack. And also you can visit our page, risingtidefoundation.net. That's great. Thank you so much. Till next week, this has been Connecting Dots. Today's new, new talk TNT.